Okay, yeah. With that, I, I would uh, really like to thank Stefan, who, who is slightly who told us that he's slightly sick this morning. Um, but it's it's great to have him, nevertheless. And I, I'm sure he will give a great talk. We just had a, a very nice chat, and uh, I'm super glad that he could make it. So with that, I would give it to Nikolai to introduce him. Okay. Thank you, Torsten, and thank you, Stefan, for uh, agreeing to be here. Stefan is a full professor at the Technical University of Berlin and also works part-time at the Fraunhofer Institute for Secure Information Technology. Uh, he obtained his uh, master's and PhD from the uh, very lovely university ETH Zurich uh, and uh, as a postdoc worked at the Chair for Efficient Algorithms at the Technical University of Munich and at the Technical University of uh, Paderborn in Germany. Uh, he has been a professor at uh, numerous institutions, um, including the uh, Alborg University in Denmark, uh, the University of Vienna in Austria, uh, and others. Um, he has won uh, more awards than I have time to, to discuss. I'll, I'll mention the IEEE Communication Society ITC Early Career Award. Um, and he has also uh, co-founded a startup company, Stactile, uh, and uh, helped establish the Vienna Cybersecurity and Privacy Research Center. And with that, I'll let Stefan take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Thank you very much, Torsten. So indeed, I hope my voice is fine uh, for now. Um, I heard that usually you take questions in the end, so that's also fine. If there is something critical along the way, so really, uh, if you don't understand something, you can also just mention it quickly. So uh, just to clarify. All right, so um, there is this folklore saying, right, that we cannot uh, direct the wind, but um, sometimes we can adjust the sails. And I wanted to tell you one of these uh, opportunities in the context of data center networks. Um, little motivation here, one second. So, um, of course, you know, most or many applications that we use today are data centric. And uh, from social networking, from business related applications, scientific applications, gaming, uh, streaming, and a lot of them uh, actually run in data centers that become hyperscale. And um, this is one of the big data centers, but there are bigger ones. And accordingly, the traffic to, from, and inside data centers is actually growing explosively. Okay, and um, the interconnecting networks are becoming a critical infrastructure of the digital society. And the problem here is that uh, network equipment is uh, reaching capacity limits currently. So this is very similar to the Moore's law that you know. So they also say there is this end of Moore law in, in networking that transistor density rates are stalling, power density rates are stalling. Um, that means that you need more and more equipment, you need larger and larger networks um, to increase the bandwidth in, in the data center. And that can be quite uh, resource intensive and, and inefficient. And that's quite annoying uh, currently for companies, but uh, I think it's a, it's a nice opportunity for researchers. And I want to show you uh, a little bit about that uh, opportunity in, in this talk. And um, one uh, root cause for this inefficiency is according to the way we currently interconnect the racks or servers uh, in data centers. Um, so here I, I show you uh, some, some racks and then typically there is some interconnect. Um, and there are many flavors um, in practice and in the literature, but um, all of them have in common that they're fixed and oblivious to the actual traffic demand. Okay, so these networks are designed without being aware of the of the of the workload, and um, that's a little bit like you can think of it like building a highway without thinking about the traffic, right? So it can be quite frustrating here that if you're in the lane here downtown in the morning, there's a lot of traffic jam, but then uh, there would be a lot of capacity on the other side, 
and maybe uh, in the evening it's the other way around. So um, similar, uh, it can be frustrating in a data center if the capacity is not allocated properly. And the vision I want to uh, share with you in this talk and elaborate a bit on the challenges is that networks and in particular data center networks should become more flexible and, and demand aware. And um, there are different ways of achieving that, different technologies. There is one a bit older technology from MIT that uh, basically they were thinking about putting mirrors at the top of a ceiling. And then uh, basically with lasers, you can uh, change the interconnect between the, the racks or the servers down there. So if you have a, a demand matrix like that, where like say rack one is communicating to five, rack two is communicating to rack six, three to seven, four to eight, then it could be ideal if you just like interconnect the racks in a way that it matches this demand. Okay, so now you directly connect rack one to rack five, rack two to six, three to seven, et cetera. And maybe later the demand matrix may change again, or it may look like that. And then uh, again, uh, you may want to rewire your data center and maybe interconnect it in a way that uh, rack one connects to two, three to four, five to six, seven to eight. And that vision we call um, self-adjusting networks, a network that adjusts themselves or the topology adjusts themselves itself to the, to the demand. Um, the motivation for this, the empirical motivation is that actually a lot of studies in data centers show that traffic has much structure. So traffic matrices are sparse, they're skewed. So there are studies from Facebook, Microsoft, and traffic is also very bursty over time in, in many data centers. And the hypothesis that we have here is that this can be exploited with these more reconfigurable data, uh, data centers. And actually, we did a study. I don't have time to go into this in detail. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk to, more, uh, to you more about it, or maybe we can even meet uh, sometime in Zurich. Um, we recently introduced a, a representation um, that we call complexity map to study the different structures of workloads in data centers. So we had um, different traces from um, database cluster, web clusters, Hadoop clusters, batch processing cluster, map, map uh, machine learning clusters, different, uh, maybe you know these um, HPC workloads that are available, CNS, multigrid. And um, we came up with a methodology that allow us to uh, systematically measure the different dimensions of structure, in particular, like the temporal structure or the temporal complexity. So complexity is just the opposite of structure. And the, the spatial structure, uh, non-temporal structure. Actually, our methodology is, is based on, uh, is quite general. And we can also study additional types of structures that you want. It's based on randomization and, and um, coding. And um, what you can see is that um, different types of applications have very different types of um, structures. So some have a very high uh, complexity in, in time, some have a very high complexity in space, but uh, none of them is like really fully uniform at random, it has no structure. And for example, neural networks have a lot of structure both in space and, um, and time. So, um, the short point here is that um, different applications have different structures and, and usually they are far from being like uniform at random. So the idea to have like a network that reconfigures itself may sound crazy, but actually there is an interesting uh, emerging technology that enables that vision and it's related to photonics. So um, actually according to H 2020 in Europe, but also in the US, um, photonics is one of the key enabling technologies, is believed to be one of the key enabling technologies for the future prosperity of our society. And uh, there is also this saying that the, the photons are the new electrons. So there's a lot of hope in these uh, photons in general, but um, also in particular here in the context of uh, networking, because there are these um, emerging optical switches that allow um, to reconfigure the topology of, of data centers. And um, there are different um, types of um, switches or optical switches that can do that. 
Um, I will not present them in detail. There is actually every year at SICOM, the, there is a workshop where people present their new prototypes and different technologies. One well-known um, example is the optical circuit switch that um, just to give you an idea how something like this could work, um, you have, uh, this is the optical switch. Then you have some uh, cables coming in and here you have some uh, mirrors that can be changed. Um, and up here you have a fixed mirror. So if some light is entering from here, then um, if the mirrors are uh, allocated like this, then the light would go here, go to the mirror, go to this mirror down and then exit there. If you would um, now rotate the mirror here, um, then um, if the light come in again like this, it would be reflected like that. It will now go to this mirror and it would exit through this port, okay? So with the changing of the mirror orientation, you can basically change the interconnect provided by the optical circuit switch. So the big picture here is that uh, on the one hand, we get this uh, new flexibility in the technology to change the topology. And we also have this observation that there's a lot of structure, especially in machine learning related applications that may be exploited by self-adjusting networks to improve performance, reduce uh, energy consumption, et cetera. Um, so I wanna show you some of the foundations here. There are many different aspects to it and also some of the trade-offs uh, that exist in this, in this setting. Uh, maybe as a side remark, um, of course, it's a big trend now to make uh, system self-adjusting and, and demand aware. So there is um, algorithmic trading. You can see there's a self-adjusting system, recommender system, uh, even a neural network is kind of a self-adjusting system, right? But what's um, a little bit different here, it's really like a, a hardware. It's like the physical topology that we change. So um that's uh, maybe one way to, to see this. Um, the first natural question uh, that may arise is, of course, what, what can it give us or how much uh, benefit can you have if you adjust your, uh, your topology? And um, it's a, um, a big question. I just want to show you one uh, maybe interesting perspective on, on this um, that we are pursuing and found is that um, there is um, a very interesting relationship to, um, first of all, data structures and also coding. So if you have self-adjusting networks, that's related to uh, self-adjusting data structures, for example. So if you have a, in your um, studies, when you learn about binary search trees, traditional binary search trees, you typically learn that it's good if, if the, the binary search tree is balanced, right? Because then you have like a logarithmic uh, access cost at most. Um, there is something called biased binary search trees or uh, demand over binary search trees that um, are optimized towards the frequency distribution of the keys. So that is like knowing which keys are more frequent and then putting them closer to the root. And um, there is something also maybe a third of those um, self-adjusting binary search trees or split trees that even dynamically change. So if maybe now uh, we're speaking English and maybe later you'll speak uh, German, then uh, the frequency distributions of the words or the letters did change, right? So um, it may make sense that um, you also over time adjust uh, some of these um, data structures to improve um, access cost further. And there's something very similar um, in information theory and coding. So if you want to send information uh, and you have like N letters, then you know that in the worst case, you need like log N bits uh, to communicate. If you know the distribution of your letters, the frequency distribution, then you can do something like Hoffman coding and you have a shorter code. You can uh, send information in a, in a more efficient way. And um, there's also something called dynamic Kaplan coding that is adapting the code also over time. So again, if you speak now language and another one, then uh, dynamic Kaplan coding is able to improve the information transmission even further. And um, the vision we had with the self-adjusting networks that there are very similar benefits. 
So if you have a, if you're worried about, let's say, the number of hops um, that your packets will travel in a data center or the number of links that uh, it traverses a graph, um, if you have a classic graph, if you have like a constant degree graph, you know, you can only have like logarithmic many, the diameter will be logarithmic. So in the worst case, you have like a logarithmic number of hops. Um, if you can make your network demand aware, um, what will be the, the number of hops you can have then? If you have a lot of structure in the demand matrix, uh, what the number of hops do you need uh, there on average or an expectation for the routing? And what if you can do it self-adjusting, like in self-adjusting binary search trees? And um, this is not just the analogy. So it turns out it's actually um, sometimes um, possible to generalize some of the concepts from coding and um, binary search trees also to self-adjusting networks. So if you have a, if you care about the path length uh, of your graph, then uh, actually the log n bound from data structures translates to a log n number of hops in a, in a, in a network. Um, you can show that the entropy of the demand matrix is actually tight bound on the number of hops in a demand aware network. And if you have it over time, you know from uh, coding theory, you have something like entropy rate. You can be as good as the entropy rate over time. And um, the same, actually, if you have a self-adjusting network, you can take the entropy rate of the communication sequence over time and basically also get entropy rate um, result on the route length, which um, not only allows us to take over some of the techniques and also some of the algorithmic principles, but also some of the concepts that we can generalize to this case. But um, actually, in practice, things are... Um, more complex or more complicated than what I just told you, because uh, now we assume that um, the whole network was basically every link was like dynamic and adjustable and so on. And um, self-adjusting networks or demand of our links may be really useful for, you know, elephant flows, like flows that are really large and you can really reconfigure a network for them. And then you can transmit very big flows on direct paths. So instead of having like on the left here, if you transmit from here to there, um, if you have a transmission here, it will take six hops, right? In our self-adjusting network, if you can directly connect them, the elephant flow only takes one uh, physical hop, which is great. And it actually saves a lot of uh, uh, resources on the links. Um, we actually call this, um, uh, actually, the um, other authors in uh, SICOM for another uh, work, they introduced this term bandwidth tax. They say, okay, if you have six hops um, instead of one, that's like a bandwidth tax because the flow needs to take resources from many links. Um, the problem with uh, adapting your network is that um, it takes time and resources, right? Because if you need to optimize your network, you need to adapt it, um, you need to run some algorithms to figure it out. So um, there is certain overhead uh, with that. And um, this overhead, we call it latency tax. So doing the reconfiguration, the optimization, um, it comes with a latency tax. And um, there is a lot of uh, different types of traffics uh, in data centers today. And I want to argue that some of the um, uh, traffic need very different types of networks to serve them efficiently, okay? So one uh, typical pattern we may see in a data center is a shuffling type of pattern that is like an all-to-all -all type of communication pattern like that arises in, uh, let's say, um, batch processing. And um, many machine learning related workloads, they have more like patterns uh, or all reduced type of um, applications. They have ring patterns or three type of um, patterns for traffic and they have a, often they have elephant flows. They have a small number of, of very big flows. Another type of traffic you may see in your data center is um, mice flows. So it's like query traffic that is uh, consisting of very small flows, so just a couple of packets. And um, these are typically quite delay sensitive, okay? So this uh, uh, query traffic uh, really needs to have a low latency. 
And then there may also be something like control traffic um, that typically does not evolve over time. It's always the same, but um, it has some spatial structure typically. So it's not like um, maybe only a certain subset of the, of the nodes are monitored or it's like a star topology to monitoring. So uh, telemetry and other types of control traffic uh, or control traffic, they may have some uh, special structure, but not a template structure. And um, these different applications, not just have different uh, patterns, but they also have um, different requirements like machine learning is maybe very bandwidth hungry and uh, small flows uh, may be latency critical. So um, we need to kind of, uh, or our point is that uh, we need to account for those in order to optimally serve uh, this type of applications. And um, besides this diversity of the traffic, uh, there is also quite a diversity in um, technology uh, for uh, good sake that we can exploit uh, in principle to serve um, traffic workloads. And um, roughly we can maybe see it along two dimensions. So one dimension is that uh, network topologies, they could either be demand oblivious or they could be demand aware. Okay, so um, this one dimension, and um, then it could be static uh, or it could be dynamic, the network topology. Um, so these are two uh, orthogonal um, dimensions. And um, for example, a lot of data center topologies today are, uh, or network topologies in general, are demand oblivious and static. Uh, for example, the clause topology, SlimFly, Expander, they are not uh, demand aware, they are optimized um, for uh, very general traffic patterns. And they're also not changed over time. And um, then there are network topologies that are dynamic and demand oblivious. For example, Rotornet, um, Opera, uh, Reese, Sirius. So there is work uh, recently by Microsoft, quite a lot, also Google. And um, you may wonder why would you build a, a dynamic uh, network that, however, is demand oblivious. Why would you change the network if you're not accounting for the demand? Uh, it's actually a really nice um, idea. It started with this Rotornet, a really nice observation that uh, we, will, we will also see later in this talk. And um, then uh, there are dynamic demand aware topologies like Firefly, Projector, Splaynet. And, um, and of course, then there are um, demand aware and static that are just optimized once, but they allow less relevant for us in the following. So we will call them uh, types down here static for simplicity. We call those rotor and uh, we call those um, demand aware in, in the following. And we are interested in the question, so which of these um, topologies are now or technologies are best um, for, for the traffic. And as very often in uh, computer science, the answer is, um, it depends, okay? So it's not, there's not one of these uh, technologies best always. Um, the mental model that you, uh, we should have here is that uh, the following. So we have a, a set of racks and then uh, typically the racks are interconnected with a set of optical switches. Okay, but these optical switches may be of different types. And um, actually each optical switch provides a matching, okay, like a graph matching. And that's why this, this model is also called a Tor matching Tor model, okay? Um, so we have a, a set of switches here, uh, K switches, and um, they are, three different types of uh, optical switches. Um, one we call periodic switch or a rotor switch. That's a switch that just cycles through uh, a sequence of matchings. So periodically in a, in a demand oblivious manner. Okay, so that's like matching one, matching two, matching three, and then matching one again, matching two, matching three. Then there are demand aware switches. They are um, optimized uh, matching. So maybe first um, we have a matching one, then we have another matching one because it's really good at this moment. Then maybe we change to three and then two and then two and then one. So over time, you can always find the, 
the interconnect uh, that is best and um, in a demand manner, manner you, you basically change the, the interconnect. And then there is the classic switch, um, it's a static switch that um, basically your patch panel that um, just provides one matching that cannot be changed. So we have this switch that maybe provides this matching always. Then there is the switch two that makes this matching always and the switch three. And uh, by combining static switches, you can uh, build different uh, topologies like a cross topology, you can build an expander. Actually, when you have a, a constant number of random matchings, you can, for example, build, a, it's known you can build an expander graph. And um, now um, to look a bit closer at the advantages and disadvantages of, of these switches, um, first maybe in, in the, in the uh, dimension oblivious to demand aware, um, rotor um, switches um, are good in very different occasions than uh, demand aware switches. So rotor switches are really good for all to all traffic. Um, why? Because a rotor, like in RotorNet, a rotor switch, you can really cycle uh, quickly through this uh, sequence of matchings. You don't need to do any optimizations. The sequence is predetermined. And um, it has been shown empirically that um, you can really shuffle a lot of traffic um, with these rotor switches because you always have direct connectivity uh, again and again, right? Not, not um, you have to wait until you get the next direct link, but you never have to like forward multi-hop. Um, you can always send it directly. And periodically, you'll get a direct connection to each other rack uh, from, from you. And uh, you don't have any overhead with the control plane, for example. The amount of our switches, they are really good um, for elephant flows, because now the, they can be optimized. If you have a big transmission from rack 4 to rack 6, then you can just uh, reconfigure the network and make a batching between the two racks. And, um, you need to amortize basically this reconfiguration because that will take time, but then um, it, it can actually really help these two switches to, to communicate a lot of data in short time. So here you have a, a lower latency tax than in a, in a demand aware network where you have quite a high latency tax. And in the, that dimension, um, dynamic static, um, you have a uh, rotor switches that, um, as we have said, uh, are really good for high throughput because you have direct connectivity. Um, static networks are really good for low latency traffic, okay? Because you don't have to reconfigure, you don't have to wait for a link to be there. It's just always there. So um, the query traffic ideally should be served on, on these closed topologies because then, or on the static topologies because you don't have to wait. And um, the disadvantage of the static networks, again, is that they have a high bandwidth tax because you need to uh, transmit multiple hops. Um, so different um, topologies provide different trade-offs. And uh, we argue that different traffic requires also different topology types. And if you have a mismatch um, between the demand and the topology, then uh, this can harm uh, flow completion times. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <clears throat> what is a good um, matching here? Let me just drink one one thing quickly. Just one second. So, sorry, I just had to do something. Um, so we have these different types of demands, right? And we have these different um, dimensions of topologies. So what is a good um, way to serve, let's say, shuffling traffic? Um, is it a good idea, for example, to serve um, delay-sensitive traffic um, on demand-aware switches? Uh, <clears throat> demand aware topologies. No, that's not a good idea because you have a very high um, latency tax. Because if you reconfigure your network, then uh, this takes time. 
is it a good idea to serve um, machine learning workloads, for example, on a static network? Um, it's also not the best, uh, typically because you have this uh, potentially high bandwidth tax because you have the multi-hop forwarding. What about um, serving uh, delay-sensitive traffic? Um, oh, sorry, I went one up. So that's also not a good idea. So um, ideally, uh, what you should do is like have an optimal matching between these uh, traffic classes and topology. So shuffling traffic, um, as we discussed, should ideally be served on the, on the uh, rotor type of topologies. Machine learning can really benefit from this demand of our uh, reconfigurable networks. Um, delay sensitive traffic should really be served on static networks, right? Because you don't have to wait for this reconfiguration. Telemetry, if you can afford it to optimize the topology once for the demand, it can really make sense to, to serve this traffic on a, on a static network. So we are uh, we built this um, framework that we call uh, Cerberus that allows to serve um, traffic on the uh, on the best possible topology. And I want to show you a bit how this um, should work, or we believe it should work. So what really matters here is um, the flow size um, um, to to which topology you should assign. Okay, so different applications. Um, typically have different flow size distributions. So um, here I plot some of them, well-known ones, web search, data mining, uh, batch processing, and also a, a Pareto distribution here. And um, first observation, different applications have different flow size distributions. Second, the transmission time of a flow um, depends on its size, right? So, um, if you um, have a 40 gigabit per second link, um, then if you have a flow of size 10 to the four bytes, you will take, uh, it will take something like one microsecond to transmit it there. Um, if the flow is 10 times larger, then it will take 10 microseconds. If it is uh, 100 times larger, it will take uh, 100 microseconds and so on. So, um, it depends on the, on the flow size, how quickly you can transmit it. Um, if you have small flows, then the, the flow completion time, of course, will really suffer if you have to reconfigure the network first, um, because it's anyway a short flow. So um, for large flows, however, the reconfiguration time may amortize, because um, anyway, the flow will be there for a long time. So the idea is here really to um, subdivide these flows according to their size and serve the static ones. So this can be analytically computed what's the best split here, but serve like the static ones um, on the static topology or the, the small ones on the static topology, the middle ones on the rotor for the shuffling, and then the, the small number of big ones, you serve them on the, um, on the demand of our network. And that's actually what Cerberus um, does. Okay, so basically we have uh, different types of switches in the interconnect. And then um, small flows are scheduled via the static switches, um, shuffle traffic via the rotor switches, and uh, the elephant flows go through the, the demand of our switches. And um, you can analytically study the, the trade off and, and performance here. So, um, how this is uh, typically done, there are different metrics and measures for um, quantifying like throughput in a network. Um, a well-known and uh, common one is, is the following that you are considering a demand matrix T and um, then you compute the throughput of the demand rate uh, matrix by seeing what is the maximal scale down factor theta of T uh, by which the traffic is actually feasible in the in the network at hand. Okay, so look at this factor, and then if you have uh, if you are given a network, then the throughput of that network, um, you consider what's like the worst case traffic matrix T, or what's the the worst factor theta for this uh, network, and that will define like the throughput that can be achieved in that uh, in that network. 
And we can apply this um, analysis to different types of networks. Actually, for the, um, the complex one, for the cerebrals, we only have partially the anal analytical results here. Um, we can uh, compute, okay, what's the, the throughput if you um, have like a static network, like an expander graph, um, what's the, um, the throughput um, if you have um, something like a rotor net. So we also can do this kind of analysis for like dynamic networks. And uh, it's quite interesting, maybe not surprising, but um, what is the worst like demand matrix for like um, a demand oblivious network, like a, a static oblivious network or, or a rotor uh, network? The, um, the worst demand matrix that defines the throughput in those cases is actually permutation. Uh, demand matrix so like this one. Okay, so one communicates to two, three to four, uh, five to six, seven to eight. So the, um, <clears throat> the very structure of the demand matrix is actually the one that gives us the, the worst throughput in this case. And at the same time, this is the, the best demand matrix for demand aware networks. Because if you have a, a matching like this, if we know that with like a single switch, we can basically perfectly uh, match the topology to the demand because we can just make a direct connection between the two. So that's um, some of the, the insights you can get if, if you do like a formal analysis of this. Um, so we can cube, compute optimal throughput here. And for um, Cerberus, actually, if you're interested in the, in the problem, we have some bounds, but like the exact uh, formula we're still, uh, we're still lacking. What we can see, however, is that also empirically this um, uh, way of optimizing the network towards the traffic can, uh, of course, um, uh, improve the throughput both for like data mining uh, workloads um, and other types of workloads that, that that people are usually studying because you can really optimize for it. Um, yeah, just um, some empirical results. So you can compute what's the optimal throughput uh, as well for demand matrix, and then you can basically see. Uh, how close does a rotor net, a rotor type of networks go, and how close does the expander type of networks come, and um, and then basically see the the trade offs here. Um, good. So that um, was um, the main um, things I wanted to say about this um, topic. So um, we believe that. Um, different uh, traffic patterns uh, that we currently observe in data centers actually uh, require different types of technologies for optimal transmission. Um, in particular, now in, in this talk, we talked about throughput, but um, also for uh, related metrics like flow completion times and so on, uh, you, can, you can benefit from, um, from the uh, topology being optimized or using the different technology towards the traffic pattern. Um, of course, there are many, many uh, challenges in this context. So really just uh, scratch the surface and uh, see the tip of the iceberg. Because um, once you start um, changing the physical topology, um, then uh, of course it has a lot of implications because now um, how do you do the routing, right? So now the network becomes dynamic. Um, how, how do you do the routing in such a network? You don't want to reconverge. We know that like, IP is, is slow in reconverging the, the shortest path. So um, we don't want to do this each time we reconfigure a network. Um, how do you do, for example, congestion control? So now we have a dynamic network. Um, does TCP, is it still applicable? So there are already some um, very nice uh, insights in how to deal with these problems. Uh, for example, that you can have something like local routing that is known for more from more dynamic networks, also in, in the context of data centers. And people have studied uh, or started to present like uh, TCP protocol variants that are optimized for reconfigurable networks. So that um, uh, that is really something that, that people are working on. And um, so far, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, any uh, showstopper that, that could um, prevent us from really fully leveraging these uh, more like dynamic technologies in the, in the data center. 
Okay, so um, that's all. I do have some um, backup slides if you are interested in, in some of the, for example, um, uh, trace complexity, how we computed that more, or about other types of or the underlying optimization problems. But um, for now, I would uh, close here and um, thank you very much for, for uh, your interest and, um, and listening and looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you so much, Stefan. I'll before we move to questions, just a, a quick advertisement. Um, our next vcast will be on the 10th of November at 6 p.m. Zurich time, and we'll have uh, Manya Gobadi from MIT speaking.